All right, um, let's go. So, um, yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Um, so the homework looms, I uh, hope not too heavily. Uh, and uh, that's coming up on Thursday. Um, if you have any questions, uh, we got office hours right after class, so I'll just, um, I won't even, I mean, I'll just stick around right after class. We can transition directly into office hours then. Okay, so um, then, yeah, if you have any questions, just let me, let me know then, or if you want to email me, um, I am mostly responsive with email. I'm a little slow these days, but uh, I'll get back to you, you know, in a few hours. Um, okay, so uh, today we're going to do Beyond GDP, as promised. Um, I've been hyping it for a while, I feel like, uh, but but we're we're really going to do it. Um, so, uh, well, I guess I'll jump right into it, but I mean, you know, we, we went over the data last time, right? Um, and by the way, I put up, let me just check that I actually did this, uh, or that it's reflected, yeah, um, on the website. This should be, no, that's not it. Um, I thought I put up, oh, here we go. Uh, maybe I didn't. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, let me just check. Uh, you know, I, last time I was, I was going through some Python code um, and, the, the, well, the Python code wasn't that important, at, at least not right now, but um, just to show you the, 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 what's going on with the data. Uh, someone asked um, if I could post that. I thought I did. Let me just um, see if I just like didn't do that. Okay, um, well, I'll check, but but I thought I posted it, but I can, I'll, I'll go ahead and double check. But um, once I do that, the, then you can go check out that code as well. And if you want to, you can even run it yourself, okay? Um, all you have to do is basically get the pen world tables data, which is just an Excel spreadsheet. And then you can, and then if you're Python proficient, then you can run that, okay? So um, yeah, I thought I did that. I don't know. I don't know where it went. Anyway, um, yeah. So anyway, we went through that data last time kind of seeing, you know, what's sort of the lay of the land with regards to uh, trends in GDP, okay? And we saw, like, where, where different countries fall, how they're growing, how they're, uh, in most cases, growing. I mean, not, not too many countries are straight up, you know, tanking in terms of GDP. The worst that happens usually is, is just a stagnation, right? So, um, yeah, and we saw some interesting trends, okay? And we sort of broke it down by, um, you know, is it, is it growth in capital versus growth in labor? versus growth in something else, which we, which we ascribe to TFP, okay, or technology, okay. And actually, last time I realized I was saying TFP, uh, is, I can't 100% remember whether I actually defined TFP, okay, so I mean, it's, it's a common term in, in macro, but I, I may have actually just forgotten to define it, but basically TFP stands for total factor of productivity. It's just a fancy word for overall productivity, okay, um, in the sense that, like, you might think, I mean, I mean it, it's total factor in the sense that it's, it's on top of capital and labor. Okay, so you know, we had this decomposition basically into capital, labor slash human capital, and other stuff. Okay, so it's just like the thing that we, we can't describe. So sometimes, oftentimes, it's called TFP or total factor productivity. Okay. Um, but yeah, so so but I have to call it technology as well. All right. So uh, yeah, so we did that. Um, I guess I could uh, let me just, I, I think I finished mostly everything that I wanted to do there. Let me just double check that there wasn't, I think at the end we were, we were rushing a little bit. Okay. Um, so let me see. All right. Let's all these. Okay. Um, so at the end, um, I think we were rushing a little bit at there at the end. So so basically we were looking at let me let me show you what I'm looking at here. Um, I'll maximize this and I'll also make it bigger. How about that? All right. So um, you know we were looking at these different graphs for GDP, right? Uh, so this was like I'll just I'll just go up to the top. So we had like GDP per capita growing naturally um, in absolute terms. Okay, for for sort of this semi-random panel of countries. Okay. Then we looked at the relative numbers. Okay, so the, the one up top is just raw GDP per capita, all right, uh, which is per population. Okay, and then, then we looked at the relative numbers and said, okay, we'll fix the year 1965. Just I sort of arbit arbitrarily chose that. 
and then see what is your GDP per capita today, or not today, but at that year that's graphed divided by 65. So everything is gonna be one. You can see they're all, it's, well, it's hard to see, but they're all one at 65, and then they grow. And, and like, well, if you look at like that, actually, then you know Korea, Botswana, and, and China are really the, the standouts, okay? So that's, you know, anytime you look at growth rates like this, and this is kind of like a growth rate, um, uh, or, you know, it's, it's a proportional metric, you know, some of it is coming from the actual amount of growth that's happened. Sometimes it can just come from from some sort of like the the initial level just being very low. Okay, so some sometimes that can that can be misleading. But I think in this case, I mean, you know, it, it is useful to think about what's the proportional level of growth. Okay, so you can you can do that too. Um, the other so that's that's normalizing by time basically, say, or like within country normalized by their their GDP at a particular time. The other thing you can do is kind of slice it in the other dimension and say, okay, well, let's look at a particular time, but normalize everything by the U.S. level, which is just sort of um, uh, often a little bit higher than the others, okay? Um, and so here you can really see what's going on with convergence, okay? So if you think about the U.S. as something approximating front frontier levels of technology and technology adoption, okay, and not too much uh, political dysfunction, um, then you might think that that the conver convergence would look like you know countries moving up towards one, which is, so so the way we do this, you know, but the U.S. is by definition one, and then you can see France, Korea, Botswana, everything, everything else. Okay, so here you can see there's still there's been movement, but there's still a lot of differences, and you might you might wonder, is, is, you know, does this sort of jive with what you have in your head internally about how you think about the world, and is it because you know, I think about the world, right? Or is it because these data aren't capturing the entire picture? Um, I think that's always a, an interesting way to, to kind of come at things from, from two directions, right? Um, and so you could, you maybe you're motivated to think about beyond GDP from this, okay? I don't know. Um, but, but I think it's certainly an interesting uh, graph to look at, okay? So that was the GDP stuff. And then you can, then you can go on to look at you know, sort of things, more, more detailed things than just GDP, okay? And the basic exercise here is we're saying, okay, well, that's great that you know GDP is growing, but we might want to know, is it, um, is it you know that they just invested a lot more in, in capital, okay, and they're reaping the rewards from that, okay, and that can be, you know, that can be important because it's like you know investing in capital is 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 a trade off, right? You sacrifice uh, today in in the hopes of better a better future, right? So. Um, Whereas technology, you have to invest in technology, but technology is a little bit more kind of, you, oftentimes you just get it for free, especially if you're adopting technology from a, a global frontier, okay? So, um, and then you might think of a similar thing about human capital is that you have to, you know, it's, it's something you invest in, it's hard, uh, it takes time, but then you, you reap the benefits in the future, okay? So so the next step to, to break down and look below GDP is to say, okay, well, kind of let's, let's um, uh, sort of, account for the changes in capital and the changes in human capital and see how much how much growth we had which is to say let's try and see okay you know even if you account for the fact that there is more capital and more human capital is is the overall sort of efficiency of the economy going up okay and that's an interesting question to ask uh, how well are we doing with the inputs that that we're using in this in these economies okay so that's the tf that's the that tfp or the the technology notion that we've been talking about you basically take GDP and you, you divide out appropriately changes in capital and changes in human capital and you see what's left over, okay? Um, all right, and so that's uh, what we have here, okay? So we're plotting that, that TFP level, okay? And, and you know, like I said last time, there's no natural scale, okay? So we need to normalize by something and what I'm normalizing is by, is by the US base today-ish, okay, 2018, all right? So, um, so that's why the U.S. Is, is at one here. Okay, so from that you can see not only there, what are the changes in the U.S. You know, and it's been about going from like seventy percent to hundred percent, so almost proportionally fifty percent increase. Okay, um, and then you can also look at these these other countries. You can see the level of convergence, uh, but you can also see how, how well they're doing. Right. So and um, it looks. I mean, if if you want to think about what one interesting thing is to look at the difference between the top graph and the bottom graph. Right. The top graph is saying overall performance. The bottom graph is saying your efficiency. How well are you doing with your inputs, right? You can see, um, so like China, China's growing in terms of total output. Their, their efficiency is also growing, especially in the 2000s, right? Uh, 
Uh, if you look at Botswana, it's a little bit of a different story. So, um, you know, you have this increase in output. But that doesn't necessarily seem like it's a huge increase in efficiency. So maybe it's more uh, capital and human capital that's happened. That's accounting for that. Okay. Um, and then, then you look at Korea. It's sort of a, it's like China. It's like kind of some TFP, some cap, big capital investment, human capital investment. So it's a, it's a more sort of broad based type of growth. Okay. And then France. Um, well, France is interesting. I mean, uh, you know, if you look at GDP per capita, right? Um, they, they sort of get close. They, go, they peak around eighty percent and then taper off a little bit. Uh, but then, like TFP is seems to be quite a bit lower. Okay, so something's going on there. Okay, and you might again ask, is that the whole picture? Right. Um, all right. So that's TFP normalized by the U.S. today. Okay. Now we can, the last thing we do is, is turn around and say, okay, well, now let's do the same thing we did before and normalize by that same country, but in 1965, okay? So now we're really looking at the growth within that country. And here you can see roughly the same thing, which is that the, the changes in TFP for, for countries like uh, Botswana, Korea, and China have, have been really proportionally very large, okay? Um, and the, fa you know, the fact that Botswana, actually, I, I misspoke here. The fact that Botswana looks flat is really just a, a graphical artifact of the scale. If you look at their relative growth, I mean, they've, their, their TFP has increased by a factor of 2.5. So they're, they're 2.5, you know, 250% more, or 150% more efficient uh, than they were in 1965 with, with their, their inputs. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that's, that'll give you a, a little bit more of a clear picture. Okay, now you, the U.S. and, and uh, say France still done pretty well it's just not they didn't have as much room in some sense to grow right so um yeah okay so all right so a lot of code here just ignore the code for now um the output is 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 what we were calling this growth decomposition before this growth accounting right so now instead of you know this this is in some sense a superset of what we just looked at with tfe so now what this is looking at is in some sense this is perhaps the best way to to get a full picture which is to say you know, we have capital, we have human capital, and we have technology. Okay, those are sort of our three things in here. That's what I'm calling capital, labor, and TFP is, is technology. Okay, so we have three lines for every country. And, and what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm actually looking at growth rates, okay, in a given year. So so each line here is, is a growth rate, you know, just like you say, at least, you know, you look, see in the news, we have 2.5% GDP growth this year. It's like that kind of thing. Okay. Um, but we're doing it for each of those three components, technology, capital, and human capital. All right. So you can see you know, in any given year how things are kind of playing out. All right. And I, I didn't smooth anything over time or anything like that. So these are just raw numbers. Okay. I mean, the first thing you can see is like, first of all, it's kind of hard to see exactly what's happening with with countries like US and France because they just don't have the same level of growth rates as, as say, Botswana and China and Korea. Right. So, um, but one thing I, I think that jumps out at me for this is the, the level of volatility. I mean, if you look at the level of volatility in China, especially for TFP, it's quite large, okay? Um, and same for Botswana, right? So um, one thing that you generally find is that countries that uh, are, are sort of farther away from the global uh, GDP per capita frontier um, tend to have a little bit more volatile growth rates, okay? Um, and that's you know, probably, there's some, you know, there's some correlation with uh, uh, GDP and sort of political stability, okay? Uh, you know, lower GDP meaning higher political stability, okay, for kind of reasons that we've alluded to at various points in the course. Um, and that would explain, you know, especially looking at TFP, right? So it's a, if you have capital, you invest in, you, maybe you just consistently invest in capital if you're China, right? Uh, but maybe the way that you use the capital becomes more or less efficient, right? So if you look at, um, so, Especially this here, you see this big drop, and it actually goes off the axis. You know, there was so there was the the Great Leap Forward in China was this big thing where they wanted to um, Mao basically wanted to like remake the country and do all these changes in terms of how production happens, and they ended up, you know, instead of having big steel mills, people were making steel, like iron in their backyard and stuff like that. It, it was a real mess, right? And a lot and it, like the, the the economic output was so bad that there was you know like mass starvation and stuff like that. So it was it was a complete disaster. And that would be very consistent with a very low TFP rate. You still kind of have uh, 
equipment there. At least, at least you bought it, but it's just being used very unproductively. Okay, so that's basically what you see here where this thing just falls off the axis, right? So they recovered from that. Okay, there's cultural evolution that was kind of rocky too. Uh, and then you see it's a little bit lower, still high volatility, but lower than before. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that there, there's kind of a story that you can tell there. And, and then if you think about, um, you know, maybe countries that are export intensive are more exposed to uh, this kind of volatility, right? So you have all the equipment there, it's just no one's buying and maybe it's exports are a little bit more volatile. Okay, so uh, that, you know, that would be, that would apply to countries like China and Korea um, and, and Colombia to some extent, right? So, um, yeah, and that, so that's, so you, that's you, you can see, you know, you look at each of the individual lines, okay? It's not clear that maybe how much you can draw from the individual lines. I mean, there's, um, if you, you, know, you look at Colombia, I guess maybe you can infer a little bit from that, which is that they, their TFP just hasn't been that growing that much, right? They've been investing in techno in um, capital and in, in human capital, but the TFP is, eh, right? Um, which is, again, consistent with just this long-term political turmoil that they've been experiencing, right? That just seems kind of intractable, okay? So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, and then you can see the, you know, the, what we saw before, but in growth rate terms for the U.S., right? What's the story there? Well, you know, late 50s, early 60s were sort of, you know, big, relatively for the U.S., relatively high levels of growth. Um, just a not a great scene in the 70s, more or less. Um, pretty consistent, 80 to 2000. Okay, and then sort of the, you know, uh, the whole area around the 2008 recession. Okay, and it, well, I guess it's kind of hard to see. I mean, maybe maybe this is 2010. It looks like the TFP TFP starts to drop a bit before 2008. Okay, so um, but but there you know you mean you can see both TFP and labor, which would be human capital, drop off. Okay, um, in a, in a pretty big way. Okay, um, all right. So so yeah, I mean that's you, you can you can decipher these and analyze them all day. Okay, but uh, but I think. Probably if you want to get like a single snapshot of what's going on or what has gone on in a country, something like, you know, looking at the growth rates for these different, th these three different channels is probably good just as a quick takeaway. Okay. Uh, because you can see the levels, you can see the volatility, you can see how much is coming from each one. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what you need. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, I guess that's all I want to say for that. Um, uh, let's 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 go beyond that. All right, we're gonna do beyond GDP now. Okay, um, so the, the the beyond GDP is cool. I mean, it, because it kind of it ties in a couple of different things um, uh, that I I've been wanting to talk about, um, and so I think it'll be useful. It, it, and it'll provide some, and it ties them in such ties them in in such a way that I think it provides motivation uh, for it. it's not just like hey here's another concept you want to learn this. Um, I think I think it ties some different things together. All right. Um, Okay, so this is, as I said before, this is based on a paper. Uh, let me over the slides. Okay, so th this is based on a, a paper called Beyond GDP. I think it's Beyond GDP something. I forget what that something is. Um, <clears throat> here we go. Welfare Across Countries and Time by, by Chad Jones and, and Pete Clino. Okay, so um, yeah, so it, it, I, I link to it here. I think I link to it in the, the main page, uh, course webpage as well. Uh, this is just the PDF. So if you want to check that out, you know, go for it. And it's, you know, they, they provide a lot more detail on how they drive things and sort of the results that they find. Okay. So, uh, but, but you can, you can also just look at the, the, the slides here and that that's going to be enough too. All right. Um, okay. But yeah, so what we want to do is it just incorporate these things that I was talking about last time. We want to add in, uh, <clears throat> things like leisure, health, life expectancy, inequality, and all that good stuff. Okay. Because, um, you know, if you think about GDP, I mean, GDP is kind of an absurd concept in some sense. I mean, you want to take the entirety of the economy and summarize it in one number is, is a pretty tall order, okay? And you're invariably going to miss stuff, all right? So so we want to kind of improve on that, okay? Um, and, you know, I mean, just the, the first pass thing would be like, well, clearly inequality, right? So, you know, GDP is just adding up all the economic activity. It's not saying... Uh, uh, where the income is going, who's getting it, you know, whether one person or one set of people is getting just a huge fraction of it and things like that, okay? So it's, it's not capturing inequality and that's something that we're pretty aware of at this point. Um, but but um, 
you know, and, and we can measure that and we'll see how we measure it. Uh, but it also, you kind of need to know, you need to have a, a sort of a framework to think about how do you balance these things out, right? So, I mean, yeah, inequality is bad, but would you rather live in a country that had twice the economic output, but maybe a little bit more inequality or a, the country with the lower economic output and lower inequality, right? So how do you trade the, these two things off is not clear ex ante. And, and part of what Beyond GDP is doing is providing a framework for how to think of them you know, in a unified setting, okay? Um, so, so that's sort of what I, I would think for inequality is probably one of the first things, okay? Although it doesn't necessarily end up being, as they find, the most important additional factor, okay? So we'll see that. Um, and then the other thing is, is not, well, I, what I would call non-market goods. And this is a pretty broad category, okay? So um, I talked last time or two times, two, two lectures ago about, you know, like gray market, black market stuff, uh, informal economy okay so that's that's uh, a little bit more applicable outside of the us okay but there's also just stuff that's that's just non-market okay so like most well a lot of child care okay i mean it depends on whether you think of k-12 education as, as including child care which i guess it does um so a lot of child care is non-market okay um and then you know just any like leisure in general okay leisure you can think of as a good right it's a good thing i think uh you can think of it as, as, as a good because, I mean, you, you, you trade it off. I mean, you, trade, you, you decide you're going to work more or less and you get more money, you get more, uh, more wages, uh, but you have less leisure, okay? So you, you can think of leisure as a good, okay? And, and in that sense, it's not market, okay? Um, so, yeah. And so, I mean, if you think about it, you know, if, if people work a lot more, that shows up in GDP because they're generating more output, but there's no, um, you don't capture the loss of leisure in GDP, right? Uh, whereas when you're trading off between two market goods, if I'm buying more apples and less oranges, to use the contrived example, uh, you see the increase in apples, but also the decrease in oranges. Okay, so the the but with labor and leisure, you don't see both sides. Okay, so that's why you would want to kind of incorporate that. All right, um, yeah, and then health and life expectancy, obviously very important. Okay, um, and those. Uh, so I mean how. Health and life expectancy are partially accounted for by GDP. I mean, if, if you die, you're not working, you're not producing. So that's going to show up in GDP. But it's not going to show up in GDP per capita necessarily, depending on how productive you are, I guess. Um, but at the same, as, in addition to that, I mean, it, um, you know, the, the, it's not just, you know, the outcome, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of sort of, you know, it's it's unpleasant, right? That's not that's not something, uh, you know, getting sick is unpleasant. That's not something that's capital in GDP. Uh, and it's also sort of stressful. I mean, it's stressful to, to live in a high disease environment, right? So that's that's another thing that's sort of relevant to welfare that are not necessarily going to show up in GDP, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, in some sense, a lot of risky stuff doesn't, it's not clear that that's going to show up in GDP, right? Because, you know, you see the G GDP, you see the average outcome, right? But if you have a really high risk situation, it's not clear that that's going to show up in GDP either, okay? So um yeah, so those are some of the motivations that we can think about um, for, for this, okay? So um, at some point I'm gonna switch over to, when I'm doing sort of more derivation stuff, I'll switch over to the, the iPad, but um, I guess we can do we can do slides for now. But um, yeah, so so I guess the, the first thing we wanna think about is, is what's our notion of welfare, okay? Because that's what we're going after. We're trying to move from GDP into welfare, all right? And so, we can think about uh, different ways for, for 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 thinking for you know constructing welfare. Okay, so um, actually let me let me go over the iPad here. So uh, okay, and so essentially what, what we want to do is we want to map or we want to come up with some concept for for defining the welfare of a country. All right, um, and there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Okay. But but at some level we want to map from utility right into welfare. So a lot of what we're doing in, and I guess I should say individual utility, individual utility. A lot of what we do in economics is based on the notion of individual utility, right? So you think about a demand function that's based on people looking at a price and kind of using through the utility function, oftentimes deciding how much they want to buy. And then you add that all up and that's demand, right? Um, and, uh, you know, sort of anytime people are making a choice, you know, if we, we, when we want to model that, we think about utility, 
right? And think about maximizing utility according to certain constraints, okay? So that's sort of the foundational in economics, okay? And what we want to do, it, you know, and then we have a bunch of different people out there with their utility functions, right? And they have some, you know, sort of they consume different types of goods and everything like that. And, and so you can think, you know, for one person, if you know their utility function, you kind of know what their welfare is, right? If you could just define utility is their welfare, their welfare is their utility, right? So if, if you're not, um, you know, that, that would be the, the non-paternalistic way to think about their welfare, right? If, if you are paternalistic, maybe you think you know better. I mean, maybe they have some utility and then you have some other function that says, well, actually, this this is this is your true utility. Like, you know, maybe, and that seems a little silly, but I mean, maybe you think about like things like addiction or gambling and stuff like that. You know, you, you could imagine some, or, you know, a, a kid, right? I mean, the literal paternalism. Uh, you know, there, there's cases where it's, it's probably reasonable. Um, but, but I think oftentimes the default assumption is, is that we should take, take people's word for their own utility, right? So, um, for now, I'm going to, I'm going to be taking people's words on their own utility and, and, and thinking about that as, as welfare. Okay. But that still doesn't pro solve the aggregation problem, right? Now we have a bunch of people, we've got the, all the utility functions. Okay. How do we add those up? If we, do we add them up? Right. Okay. So that's really, um, the big difficulty okay so we have a couple of tools and concepts out there that have helped us along the road so far that i assume you've seen i hope you've seen uh so you know you can think about pareto efficiency right that's 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 related to this aggregation problem in some sense okay so the you know, pareto efficiency says it's a you know it's an allocation of say goods such that you can't reshuffle the goods and make everyone better off or you know make everyone weekly better off at least so so everyone's better off and no one is worse off okay um so, uh, the, the, you know, that, that, it seems like a desirable property. Okay. Though it's, it's not, um, clear that it's, it's must, you know, it's not clear that if, if, if an allocation is not Pareto efficient, that it's, it's necessarily bad. Okay. Uh, but it seems like it's probably a good thing to start off with. Okay. Um, so that's out there. That's interesting. I mean, it's, it's a useful concept. Okay. And, and, um, well, I'll get back to how it might relate to, to what we're talking about here, okay? So, um, but but this whole process of mapping from, I'm going to draw an arrow at this arrow, the whole process of mapping from individual utility to welfare is sort of called social choice, okay? In the sense of, like, we're not just doing this for kicks. I mean, we're doing this so we can make societal choices, okay? So, so or maybe social choice theory, right? So so when this whole process of, of, of aggregating utility is it sort of relates to this notion of social choice theory where we want to come up with ways to make decisions as a society. Okay. And to do that, we kind of have to come up with ways to solve this aggregation problem. Right. Otherwise, if I propose some policy change, okay, well, we, we can kind of see it makes, you know, person A better off and person B worse off, but how do we trade? How do we truly um, come up with a framework for trading those off? Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, there's a couple different ways, and so I'm going to kind of list them off, all right, to do this. Okay, so one is probably, I mean, certainly a term you've heard before, uh, utilitarian, util, utilitarian, okay, kind of lost the end there, uh, approach, okay? So that's um, generally what people define that as, is they say that, you know, and this this is like um, utilitarian within what we're talking about. There, there's a general, a slightly more general philosophical notion of utilitarian, which I'm not necessarily capturing here, but within the confines of like what economists do, uh, utilitarian would be this. Okay, so I'll tell you what I'm what I'm talking about here. Um, why don't I use J? I usually use I, but for some reason I use J. Um, okay, so what this is saying, what does this mean? Um, okay, so utility function, we know what that is. Okay, that um, that's a function that in a yeah. Okay, so here I'm saying we only we only have one good. Okay, when I, when I so C J, this is you know person J's utility. Uh, sorry, consumption. So this is like a composite of all the different goods that you consume. Um, I'm, I'm not in general a utility function maps from you know how much of every single good do you consume into a number, okay? Here I'm saying there's some composite CJ, which captures sort of how much you're consuming. Maybe it's your income or your, your, your the total amount of, uh, really properly it would be like the total amount you spend on consumption, 
goods, right? So, um, yeah, so it's sort of a simplification, but it's 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 sort of your an overall measure of your consumption, okay? And then utility function maps that consumption level into a number, okay? Um, and then what utilitarianism, or the utilitarian, say, social choice function, okay? Uh, which is, so like this, this is, I guess I should say, this is a social choice function in the sense it maps from individual's utility, U, into W, okay? Um, all right, and so then utilitarian, all it does is takes the average, okay? All right, it's just saying, you know, if you're in utility land, if you're better off by X percent and someone else is worse off by X percent, then then nothing's changed because it's just, you know, it's sort of zero sum in some sense, right? Um, but if ever, you know, if, if I'm, you know, if you're better off by 10% and I'm worse off by 1%, utilitarian might say, okay, well, it's worth it. Sorry, Doug, you know, you're going to lose out a little bit, but it's worth it, right? So um, that's the basic idea, right? So, and, and, and there's criticisms of that. I mean, you can talk about, um, uh, you know, it, 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 your utilitarian thinking can, can lead to things that seem kind of inhumane sometimes, right? Uh, making one person just extraordinarily well off and everyone else suffers a little bit utilitarian approach might say yeah go for it that person's just like amazingly well off uh but you might not think that that's fair right and so there's, there's sort of rights based arguments for why this isn't necessarily good in all cases right so um yeah so i'm not saying this is good or bad as as a as an option it's just it's something that's out there okay um okay and so you know there are also problems with this right uh one of the biggest problems is well how do, how do we know you i mean what where does you come from do we just assume it do we try to measure it somehow that seems difficult um that's a pretty big issue right so um <clears throat> and the way i've written it here uh I, i'm kind of the fact that i just have one function u right uh i mean i'm assuming that everyone is kind of the same everyone has the same utility is what i'm assuming with this formulation okay which which again is, is clearly not true Okay, and the question is, is it even approximately true? I don't know. Um, but, you know, so I, I could write a little j here and say that everyone has a different utility function, right? And that maps from their consumption into their utility. But at that point, I mean, how do you, I mean, how do I know what people's utility function is, right? Do I ask them? If I ask you your utility function and you know that I'm gonna use this utility function for social planning purposes, you would probably say that your utility function is somehow very large or very sensitive or something like that. So you'd say like, you kind of lie, basically. I'm not saying you guys are liars. You would have an incentive to lie, right? You would have an incentive to sort of misstate your utility function uh, in order to, to maximize your own true utility, right? So the the, the issue is, is rather, prof not profound, it's, it's rather, uh, seems intractable, right? How do you get people to tell, tell you your utility, right? Because um, essentially, you know, if, if some, I don't know what's a good, uh, I, I guess I'm thinking about like, you know, there's like these, these the, the local level, they have these planning boards and someone's like, I want to put, I know there's something where someone wanted to put a statue of a transformer in front of their house, right? Maybe you don't like the transformer statue in front of this person's house, right? This is actually a real thing in DC. Um, and so you might not like, maybe you just, you're not like a fan. It's not like the worst thing in the world, but you're not a fan. But you kind of have an incentive to just say this, to go out and say this is terrible, this is going to ruin the neighborhood, everything, this is this is the worst thing I've ever seen, because that way it's going to influence the outcome more, right? So that's kind of the same thing here, is that you, you have an incentive to, to misstate your utility, okay? Um, now, that that's not just a problem with the utilitarian, that's a problem with basically everything we're going to do in this whole welfare framework, okay? So, um, but it is a problem, okay? But we're going to ignore it. We're just going to assume we know their utility. Or we're going to assume we kind of know the class of functions that your utility space exists in. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell you what that means in more detail in a minute, but we're gonna assume we know a little bit about their utility. Maybe we can infer stuff from their actions, right? You can infer how much someone values leisure by looking at how much they work, for instance. We're gonna do that. Um, uh, but we're gonna assume kind of the, 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 the basic structure is, is common across people, okay? All right, so that was a really long winded of saying way of defining utilitarianism okay but in this context it's just you take the average utility okay um but that's not the only way to do it okay um 
the other big com- competitor here in, in social choice function land um, is uh, Rawl, Rawlsian. Okay, yeah, I spelled that right. Uh, Rawlsian kind of approach, okay? Um, named after John Rawls, who was uh, kind of a philosopher fellow, um, possibly alive. Uh, I think he might be alive. I'm not sure, though. Um, but yeah, he was a philosopher. And uh, so, so the idea here is that W is going to be the minimum over J of U. Uh, I'll just write U of CJ. I could write UJ to, to mean everyone has a different utility function, or I could write U to say everyone has the same. I don't know. Okay, so we'll just keep it as U for now. Okay, so this is saying, look at everyone's utility. Whoever has the worst, that's your social welfare. Okay. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, so I think there's some appeal to this. Okay. It, it, it uh, this, this doesn't suffer from the same sorts of criticisms that utilitarianism suffers from. Okay. And by the way, I just realized it may not have been clear. This symbol here, this guy, right? That's the, 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 technically it's a cap. I think it's a capital sigma or something like that. Anyway, that means sum. That's a, that's just like the summation. Okay. So if, if I say like the summation of XI, you're summing up all the different XIs. Okay. Over I. So here I'm just saying sum from person one to person N, sum over all their utilities. So, so this is just average. This is an average. Okay. One over N times the sum of all of them. It's just the average utility. Okay. So I didn't realize that they probably should define the terms here, right? So this is saying sum over each individual per, uh, each individual person. Okay. Here, sum over each individual person over J from one to N, the utility, and then divide by N. So it's just the average utility. Okay. Um, that's the utilitarian. Okay. Now Rawlsian is min utility. We're saying look over everyone and look at the minimum. Okay. Right. So what this does is it really penalizes inequality. All right. You could, um, if, if you think of, think about a world that's zero sum. Okay. You know, you have like, uh, you know, you, so so option one is, is uh, you, how should I say this? Uh, th- think about a world that's zero sum and you have two people, okay? And in one world, you can just give both of them, you know, a half of the, the total resources. Let's say there's one total unit of resources. You can give them each a half, okay? That's like world number, world A, okay? And then uh, in world B, you know, maybe you can give, uh, you know, one person you give three quarters. Okay, you can see that, right? Um, and then you give the other person one quarter. Okay, so that's world B, right? So clearly world B has more inequality, right? Uh, world A is perfectly equal. It's sort of the, the, the utopia with two people. Uh, it's perfectly equal, okay? So the, the welfare, the Rawlsian welfare for world A would be a half, right? Whereas the Rawlsian welfare for world B is the min would be a quarter, right? So if you, t- if you increase inequality, okay, uh, you know, even if you keep the, the overall amount of resources the same, you're, you're hurting yourself in a Rawlsian sense, okay? So what, you know, if, if you have exactly one, you know, a fixed amount of resources, you know, let's say that it's one, uh, and you have, say, N people, okay, now instead of just two, how, you know, what's the best way to just purely redistribute those resources uh, according to the Rawlsian metric? Well, you would, you would give everyone one over N. Right, you would evenly divide them amongst all people, right? Because if, if you gave one person a little bit more, you would invariably have to give someone else a little bit less, right? And then that, that would penalize your min, right? Whereas, you know, so if you have any variation, you can just compress things and you're gonna increase the minimum. And so you would keep going until you have a perfectly equal allocation. Okay, so the Rawlsian, in, in, in a pure allocation sense, the Rawlsian metric would tell you to, to have a perfectly equal society, okay? Now, and then if you think about the utilitarian using the same setup where you have one unit of resources and we're dividing it amongst n people, well, the utilitarian doesn't care, right? Um, well, actually, no, sorry, I misspoke. The utilitarian actually may care. If, if, if everyone had linear utility, then the utilitarian would not care, right? If any if everyone has linear utility, then the, the total, you know, uh, the total sum of utility would be the same as the total sum of, of resources, which is fixed, okay? 
I'm not, I, 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 that may not make sense right now because I, I don't think I explained it very well. Um, let me try again. So, okay, so we, we argue that with brawls, if you're just allocating a pie, you have a fixed size pie, you're just allocating amongst people, you would want to have perfect equality because otherwise you could kind of, you could always you know, redistribute resources such that the min would go up. Now, uh, you can't go any farther than perfectly equal, and so that's where you'd stop, okay? Now, with utilitarian, does let's think, does the same thing apply, okay? And what I'm arguing is that sometimes, but not always, okay? But usually, maybe, okay? So, so, um, well, so first, it, it, it depends on the utility function, okay? So if the utility function is linear, okay, that means that, um, you know, if, if if you increase one person's utility by a certain amount, or consumption by a certain amount, and decrease the others by a certain amount, the average is still the same. Okay, right. So so uh, if the utilities function is linear, then this utilitarian welfare metric really doesn't care, wouldn't care about how you allocate goods between people. All right. Um, Okay, I guess you can you can actually think about this graphically, all right. Um, so think about um, uh, we have C, C J, you know, I guess C J, right? Uh, and then utility. Okay, so what I'm saying is if if the utility function is linear, okay, and this is zero, okay, and and it, you know your utility, let's say your utility at zero is zero, okay. All right, and then it just goes up linearly. The slope of this could be anything. It doesn't matter, let's say it's m greater than zero. Okay, um, all right, so uh, essentially, you know, if if, uh, if you have world A, right, think about world A where everyone has uh, a half, okay? Okay, so in world A, everyone has a half, their CJ is, is a half. Okay, all right. So the, these are the C, these are CJs here, right? So in, in world A, C one and C two are a half. Okay, in world B, C one is three quarters, and C two is one quarter, right? So this is like here, and then in world B, C one is three quarters, and C two is one quarter, right? So C one is is the consumption for person one. And C2 is the consumption for person two. Okay. So now we can think, okay, uh, in, in world A, they're both at a half, right, here on, on the x-axis, right? And then their utility is something. Okay, let's just say that U of C is equal to C. This is linear utility, right? Okay, so so everyone's utility is just literally their consumption. It's, it's a very simple utility function, but let's that that would that would be an example of a linear utility function. So, in that world, then their utility is a half, okay. And since each person's average utility is a half, the the overall wealth, or sorry, each person's utility is a half. The welfare, which is in the utilitarian world, just the average of utility, is also a half, okay. So, um, right. So so with linear utility. Welfare in world A is a half. Okay, now we want to think. Okay, now what's what's the welfare in world B? So this is you, you utilitarian with linear utility. Okay, that's what that's sort of what the, the case we're looking at. What's the welfare for world B? Okay, so well, world B we can we can look at here too. We can say here's a quarter. Here's three quarters. Okay, so in world B, this is where person one is, because this is, yep, let's see one in world B. Um, and then here's person two. Okay, so world B, we're just we're just you know, sort of spreading the, the distribution out. Okay, now, but since it's linear, if you look at the average utility, it's still going to be a half. The average of, of a quarter and three quarters is still a half. Right, and no matter what how you divide the pie, that average utility is still going to be exactly a half. Okay, so WB is also a half. Okay, and so no, you know, no matter how you stretch it, things out. If you, you give one person one and the other person zero, and so on, that that utilitarian 
welfare function with linear utility is always going to tell you the same answer, which is that the utility is just half. It's the average amount of resources. Doesn't matter how you spread them out. Okay. All right. So that's um, uh, sort of a stark result, which is that the utilitarian planner doesn't care about the distribution if you have linear utility. But you know the reason there's two things: you need to be utilitarian, and you have to have a, a world with linear utility. Now, the world we probably don't have linear utility. Okay. Um, there's there's there is a clearly such a thing as a decreasing margin utility. If you have a ton of certain type of good, your utility for it is going to decrease. Um, and uh, you know even if you think about you know these are these are like think about overall consumption, right? Think about if you if you have a, you know uh, an intertemporal trade off, right? Would you know would you prefer to have a ton of money today and almost none tomorrow, or would you prefer to have a look, you know, sort of an average or middle median amount of uh, uh, money today and tomorrow, right? So I think a lot of people would probably prefer to smooth out their consumption a little bit, okay, rather than go to these these extremes, okay, and that's pretty much because of because utility is is nonlinear, you're decreasing marginal utility, right? So if you're really rich today, you have low marginal utility, and if you're really poor tomorrow, you have high marginal utility. You, want to save some money for tomorrow basically okay so it's sort of the motivation behind saving okay so um but but that that really is the non that, that's coming from nonlinear utility so let me let me draw you the same picture but with a nonlinear utility function i think we'll be able to see what's going on okay so all right um so let's say we have cj here same same axes cj and u the only thing we're going to change is the shape of the utility function we're going to make it concave all right, so now it's gonna look like that. Okay. Um, all right, now we, we can, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna compare world A and world B, okay, in the utilitarian setting, but now we're gonna think about a non-linear utility function, a con specifically a concave utility function. Right, so first of all, you can see the concave utility, as you get higher and higher in terms of consumption, the slope goes down, that's that's decreasing margin utility. All right, the, 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 up here, the slope is relatively low, or it's down here, the slope is relatively high. Okay, that's that's concavity, and that's all the equivalently that's decreasing marginal utility. All right, so let's look at, um, you can see that, right? Yeah, okay, so let's look at uh, world A, okay, where they both have a half. So we can map up to this on the y-axis, right? So this is saying consumption is a half, but then utility is whatever this utility line says it is, which is, well, I don't know what it is. It's, it's uh, you know, examples of this would be, you know, U of C equals the square root of C or something like that, or even like U of C equals log of C, right? Um, it's not gonna look exactly like this, but it, it'll look some, some kind of concave function, all right? So it doesn't really matter what it is. It's just like, it's U of a half, okay? Um, all right, and so that's, that's, that's world A, okay? And then if we think about world B, Right now, where let's see, let's see, this is one and this is three quarters, right? And this is one up here. So uh, now with world B, we can we can do the same thing. Okay, so well, look at person. I guess this is person two. This is u of a quarter. Okay, so they have some utility, and then person one is three quarters. All right, this is u of three quarters. Okay, all right, so now. What, what can we do? Okay, so how, how can we think about this utilitarian function? Okay, so essentially, um, the uh, utilitarian function is, t is taking the average utility, okay? All right, so the question is, you know, for, for world A, just uh, mathematically for it out, the utilitarian, Utility for world A is um, one half u of a half plus one half u of a half, which is just u of a half, right? So whatever the utility is for person, you know, this, so this is person one here, this is person two, right? So um, just applying that formula. It's just the average utility, so it's one half times the utility of person one, plus one half times the utility of person two, which in this case is just u of a half. All right. 
So that's world A, and then world B is one half U of, so person one, well person one is actually the rich one, so they had three quarters, plus one half U of the remainder for person two is one quarter, okay? So that, that doesn't simplify anymore, so, but, but it's, it's the average of those two, of the three quarters and the one quarter level, okay? And, and because those averages were this, the same in the linear world is why we got that, that sort of indifference result. But now here, if you look at, at, at the graph, so you can draw a line between these two points, the point for u of one quarter and the point for u of three quarters, okay? Essentially, the, the average is gonna be this value here, this, this, where this line goes through a half. Okay, so if you, if you, um, because, let's say, if, if you just draw a line between two points, then the average value is going to be the value at the average, the average y value is going to be the value of the average x value, right? So that, that average right there, that's going to be, that's wb, all right? And then the point on this curve up here is wa, right? That's u of a half, okay? And so you can see, well, maybe you can't see. Let's zoom in, all right? So you can see here that w that WB, which is on that line, is below WA, right? And and th think about changing this, t taking that concave utility function. Remember, this is our utility function. But if you make it linear, then those two lines coincide, right? If you make it linear, then that, that WB and the WA will coincide. But the more concave it is, the more that, that, that average line that we draw is below for WB is below WA, okay? So it's that concavity, that, that uh, inutility, the nonlinearity that, that gives you this result, okay? Right, um, okay. Right, you can see that if you, if you do the same thing, uh, let me just adjust this here. If you do the same thing up for this linear utility graph, you could draw a line, but it's just gonna sit on top of the existing line and, and WA will be equal to WB. Whereas in the concave world, WB is worse. Okay, so okay, so that that's um, that's sort of the, the the geometric proof there. Okay, but but what it's saying is just that in the utilitarian world, you're going to penalize inequality, but it's going to be um, it it it's, and it's going to be uh, more penalized the more decreasing marginal utility you have, the more nonlinear utility is. Okay, so. Um, all right, so then the, what's the takeaway from that? Uh, the takeaway is if you're thinking about the utilitarian world, okay, you're going to penalize inequality. If you have a, a, a fixed pi that you want to allocate and you have even slightly concave utility, which is reasonable, uh, then there also you would want to do perfect equality, right? Because, look here, I mean, if, if you think about this graph down here, if you can compress, you know, with, with one quarter and three quarter, that's, it, that makes you, your welfare is lower than with one half, one half. For any points, you know, for any allocation that isn't one half, one half, if you, if you make more and more equality, you're going to end up closer to that, that maximal point, right? Um, and so, so essentially, because of the nonlinear utility, you're always going to have this force pushing towards more equality, okay? And in fact, the optimal level is to just have perfect equality for even for this utilitarian approach, okay? Um, all right. So then the question is, okay, so wait, I've given you two, amongst many, uh, sort of social choice approaches or social choice functions, um, and they both give us the same basic answer, which is that we want perfect equality. Okay. So what's the catch? Why? Why is that? Um, and essentially, uh, part, the reason is, is is the way I'm framing the, the problem, okay, it, it, as a, a, a pi division problem, okay? So oftentimes, the world isn't just so simple as we have a certain amount of resources and we just want to decide, like, who to give them to. If the world were that simple, it actually, we maybe could have a perfect, you know, equality uh, utopia, right? I don't know. Um, or that might be desirable. Um, and I still think it is kind of desirable, but... The, the, the reason why we may not achieve that is that there's often a trade-off between uh, the, the total amount of resources, okay, and how you distribute them, 
Okay, so maybe you've ter heard the term like equity efficiency trade-off. Okay, so it might be that you're not just deciding amongst a fixed amount of output how much do we give to each person, right? It might be that you're uh, deciding, okay, option A is we have a ton of output, but it's kind of unevenly distributed. And option B is we have less output, but it's more evenly distributed, okay? And it's not obvious which of those two you would choose, okay? Um, now, when, when you think about that type of choice, an equity sort of an equity efficiency trade-off, where you you have one world with you know high output, high inequality, versus one world with low output, one inequality, low, sorry, low output, low inequality. Um, when you think about that type of choice, that actually does put some daylight between the utilitarian approach and the Rawlsian approach. Okay, because if if you think if you're a Rawlsian, you know you really, really care about the poorest person a lot, right? That, in fact, that's basically the only person that you care about. The poorest person isn't one person, but it's whoever happens to get the least resources, right? Um, so if you're a Rawlsian and you look at those two options, you would choose the low total output, low inequality world, probably, all right? Because the high output, high inequality world probably has someone that's fairly poor, okay? So you, if you're a Rawlsian, you're, you're fairly... Um, aggressive about inequality reduction okay which is fine it's just that's that's the implication of that util that welfare function okay um the utilitarian though is is a little bit more some sense nuanced about the trade-off in the sense that they're you know they're they're willing to give up inequality for for more total output okay you know the 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 the, the, the uh what is it the popular notion of utilitarianism, right, is is sort of this ruthless pursuit of, of total output. You know, maybe, maybe some people get hurt along the way, but we're, we're going to do it because it's, it's it's for the greater good, right? So that's that's the popular notion of utilitarianism. And that's kind of reflected here in the sense that they're, they're willing to go for the uh, high output, high inequality option. Okay, so that's not to say they would always go for that, right? Um, you, you could, uh, they're, they're they're willing to go for it if it's worth it, right? If, if the, the increase in inequality is relatively small and the increase in output is relatively large, then they're probably willing to do that. Uh, if it's the other way around, then maybe not. Okay, so um, yeah. Uh, so, so those are two types of social choice functions, okay? Um, I'm trying to think of there. I mean, you could, you could there's an infinity of other ones you could imagine, okay? You could imagine, you could imagine, say, like, and this 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 might actually be relevant um, practically. I mean, the, in terms of what we see in the world, you could imagine a, a more paternalistic uh, social choice function where you just you actually maximize total output, right? So instead of maximizing U of C, the sum of U of C, or the average of U of C, you, you'd actually maximize the sum of C itself, right? Um, and so that that would be, you know, if if you if you're uh, government, right, and you're looking at GDP numbers and you're like, we really want to increase GDP, you might look more like a, a total output maximizer, right? You're, you're even more kind of ruthless than the utilitarian, right? Um, because you don't you don't think about people's utility necessarily, you just look at total output, okay? So the utilitarian isn't just a pure GDP maximizer, okay? It's it's it's, it's the utility maximizer, it's just the, the way that you trade off people's utility, okay? So, um, yeah, all right, so that's I think that's important. Okay, and and all this stuff about you know sort of social choice, social welfare is going to form the foundation for how we think about beyond GDP. Okay, uh, and we're going to incorporate it. And in fact, we're we're actually going to go with oops this utilitarian approach. Just it's it's um it's a little bit more tractable, and and I think it's reasonable. Okay, uh, so we're going to go with the utilitarian approach, but we're going to add in stuff. We're we're basically going to say okay, well we're going to put stuff in the utility function, and then kind of see how does that end up reflecting itself in welfare when we calculate the average welfare okay so um so that's the idea okay so uh and i guess yeah i'm a little short on time here um yeah so then how should we do this i'm not going to be able to, to cover almost anything in the next five minutes so um but, but I guess what I'll say is the the next steps we're gonna take okay and essentially first I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how do we you know how can we look at this in the data okay and it's, it's helpful 
Okay, and then kind of the, the next real thing we're gonna do is um, looking at incorporating this new stuff. Okay, so so what we're gonna do is, um, you know, for instance, if we want to incorporate leisure, okay? So let's see, we're gonna incorporate this notion of leisure, okay? So if we wanna do that, we're gonna say, we're gonna put leisure in the utility function. So instead of saying, you know, just, each person is is uh, has some consumption level CJ in terms of goods, and that leads to utility. We're going to say uh, each person has some consumption level CJ and some amount of leisure LJ. Okay. Right. I think that's what I call it. Yeah, LJ. Right. So that that's and so so here leisure is is basically a good. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and so you know, and so then well, what is the utility function? Okay. I don't know, but we're all, we're often going to kind of fall back onto logarithmic stuff because it, it works well, okay, and it, it it's easy to easier to calculate stuff. So 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 we'll probably do something like you know log of cj plus I'm going to I think we choose eta times log of l. Okay, so what this is saying is that um yeah you you, kind of, you this is how you trade off consumption and leisure okay and this eta thing okay well, what is eta that's just kind of an indicator it's a number that c characterizes how much you care about leisure okay so you know it, i don't know it's not clear you know how how much do people care about leisure how much how much uh, you know how much income are you willing to to give up for losing one hour of leisure by having to work or or conversely you know um you know how much uh income are you you willing or sorry, how much do you need to be paid to give up that one hour of leisure and work right so that this clearly relates to kind of wages so how you trade off these things and, and decisions about labor okay and so what we're gonna kind of in the background you can think about like well this is the person's utility function right um and like the, their uh consumption one way to think about it is their consumption is going to be their wage times how much they work Okay, which which I'm gonna say is is one minus, but this would be a j, uh, one minus l j, right? So the 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 idea is you have like one unit of time in the day, right? So if you do leisure l j, you're gonna be by definition you're gonna be working one minus l j. You don't do anything but work in leisure, so I guess we'll include sleep in leisure. Um, and if you work one minus l j, then you're gonna have total income you just multiply that by your hourly wage say um and that'll give you your total income right so this is how you can think about like this is like a budget constraint here okay now the other thing you can do is is just you know, so this is going to be w minus w times lj okay you can actually rearrange it if you move that w times lj over to the left okay when you write it like this you can see how the leisure is sort of like a good Okay, leisure is a good and, it, and its price is W. Okay, you, if you wanna buy an hour of leisure, you have to pay W because you're working one hour or less, right? So you work one hour or less and you take leisure one hour more and, and the price is W. Okay, so that's why I'm saying a wage is like the price of leisure, okay? The price of goods, we're kind of normalizing to one, okay? And then the price of leisure is W. Your total income is just like the total, what's the most you could possibly make is if you worked all the time. Okay, so that would be one times W. Okay, so the idea is here is, this is like your income, it's not your real income, it's like your total income, including leisure. And then these are two different goods, consumption goods and leisure goods that you're sort of buying. Okay, so it's, it's a different way to think about the, the labor leisure choice when you think you can, but you're thinking about leisure as a good. Okay, so um, that's, gonna, that's gonna be the framework that, and we're gonna use this utility function here in particular, that's gonna be the framework in which we think about this. We're gonna look at that and see how does that map into welfare Okay, and then we'll also think about how we can compare countries, right? So if we see countries with higher or lower consumption and higher or lower leisure, how do we assess which one do we think is like better off in some sense that, that I'll define in, in, in a bit. Okay, so because once you have that welfare notion, then you can also compare countries in terms of welfare. Okay, so that's sort of the end game, all right? Okay, um, that's it, we're out of time. Uh, so I'll stick around if you guys have questions about anything, um, including homework, happy to answer them. Okay, and yeah, so then the homework is due, uh, it's just before class on Thursday.